So what do we have today then of antibiotics? This here shows a slight overview of what's currently available. And you have to remember one thing now. Now I talk about antibiotic for systemic use. It means you take it as a tablet, it's distributed in your entire body. It's not something we have locally on the skin. That's different classes again. And you see, it's, it's quite a few of them. And then you see, I, I highlighted one. That's the yellow one down here. That's drugs only for tuberculosis. And tuberculosis is considered to be a different sort of piece of, you know, infections, a little bit tricky to handle. Important thing now, this class, you see there are only two names here. It means that is very few drugs available to treat that. And then you might say, ah, tuberculosis, that's not a problem in Sweden at least. So we don't have to worry about that. Yeah, but then we have the problem. We travel. We travel to countries where tuberculosis is a problem. So you can get infected. And the second thing, quite recently, some researchers have published a paper where they say that they think quite a number of the human population carry the bacteria around, but you don't get tuberculosis. It means that it's latent, it's lying there, just waiting to break out. If that's really true, this, this might be a big problem in the future. All the other ones here, that's uh, antibiotics for normal infections, not tuberculosis. And you see there are several subclasses. And I've drawn up the structure of four of them that we're going to look a little bit on to illustrate a few examples. The lower one here is a completely synthetic compound. Those three belongs to this class, beta-lactams. They are semi-synthetic or natural product. Most of the compounds you see here for all these drugs are mainly natural compounds. It's only this one, which is completely synthetic. So nature makes quite a few very useful antibiotics. What do these antibiotics do to the bacteria then? Well, this is a very schematic illustration of a bacteria. And then you see I have these uh, tablets here. One, two, three, four. And basically, more or less all the ones I had on my previous slide, they do one out of these four mechanisms, meaning they either interfere when we go from uh, or do replication, transcription. Replication means copying the DNA. Transcription means we make mRNA. So that all works on the, on the nucleic acid level. We have some drugs that interfere with translation, how we convert mRNA to a protein. We have a third class that do something with the cell wall in the bacteria. And the fourth class is it interfere with what we call essential metabolites. So take home message. There are four main mechanisms. That's how the majority of all antibiotics works. This is the quinolones, the completely synthetic ones I talked about. And you see basically down here, I, I've written what they usually do, the sort of very general mechanism of these. It's synthetic, and it, you can say it in the fair replication, that's the simple view of it. Then you can say, you see what is called R here. It means that it could be different types of things sitting there. And these things have a major impact on what this drug do. I just have a few slides to illustrate that for you. That functionality showed in, uh, in this circle is critical for activity. If I change that, I don't have an antibiotic anymore. In these R groups here, you see I've drawn out different types of functionalities. And it's not so important to remember exactly what it is, but it means what you have here have an impact on the activity. 
And basically what you see on this slide is what I call the structure activity relationship. You remember that picture, the glow and the hand? I want to find the hand that fit perfectly into the glow. That's basically what I've done here. And then you see that all these different functional groups, they have an impact on the activity. As soon as you see an arrow pointing upwards, it means increased activity. So having, for instance, this system sitting in this position, that increased activity towards what we call gram-positive bacteria, and so on. So it means by just varying what is sitting on that central core of the molecule, I get antibiotics that have different types of activity and activity towards different types of bacteria. So I can tune that. But then you remember, I talked also about, we have something called toxicity, meaning what sort of side effects could this drug give? What sort of other things could it interact with? And properties, pharmacokinetics. And again, if you look at these functional groups we have here, if R7 is what we call bulky, it means that it gets big. Side chain, half-life goes up. It means how long does the drug circulate in the bloodstream? If you think about that, is that important? Well, yes, it is. Because if it's out of the body too quickly, it won't find the bacteria. It does nothing. If it stays too long in the body, we're probably going to get side effects from it. So the half-life should be appropriate for whatever we want to achieve with the drug. So that's important. Then you also see something I call CNS penetration. CNS stands for central nervous system. If you have bacteria that are in your central nervous system, we need an antibiotic that can enter the central nervous system. And by increasing the size and the bulkiness here, we get more and more CNS penetration. So it's just to illustrate again, we can tune the properties of the drug, how it travels around the body. These other examples here, they, um, they illustrate similar things. But what you should remember from this is, these functional groups partly say something about the structure activity relationship. Some groups are very really good for getting you know, high activity. And this also shows that the same groups is also responsible for toxicity, how it's distributed, physical properties of the drug.